Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, a Southside bar is back, and so are the Steelers. We've got recommendations for making the most of a bunch of free events this fall, plus an update on the city's call for local bow hunters. It's September 8th, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh is talking about. I'm with CityCast producers Mallory Falk. Hey. Good morning. And Sophia Lowe. How you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> doing good. Um, does it feel like fall yet? I feel like we keep talking about that. It's been 90 degrees most of this week. Now that it's raining, at least it's not 90 degrees anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mallory, I feel like you have the hottest recording studio among the three of us. Does it still feel like summer for you? Yeah, I'm. we have barely even started this conversation. I'm on the verge of passing out. So I hope this is the last week we're in the 90s. <laughs> Here's open. Um, well, we thought we'd kick it off with a little Southside update. Um, Carson City Saloon, the enormous bar on the corner down there on East Carson Street, reopened this week after voluntarily missing an entire preseason worth of bar sales. I can't imagine what kind of hit that meant for the ownership. So I have never been to Carson City Saloon, and I actually had to (laughs) Google where this was. Uh, (laughs) And I also saw that they closed in response to a shooting. But it also sounds like the business owners have been upset about violent crime in the neighborhood for a while. Yeah, I don't think this owner is alone. And some other places have said that they wanted to move business or not hold events in the neighborhood because of it. Um, Carson City ownership, um, one of the guys is named Brian Vettier. He told the Trib that his decision was two years in the making. Um, And then this is what he shared with Fox News. We've had about uh, 50 meetings over the last two years with other bar owners and residents, with the city officials, mayor's office, police, And it seems like um, they talk a a big game, but uh, nothing's really gotten done. And that's that's the sad thing about it. And and all we really want to do is just stop the violence. Like it's not a political issue. This is a it's a public safety issue. It's tough listening to business owners like this. Like I totally feel for him. I've been at Carson City. Like it's always a rowdy crowd. Like that's sort of what the South Side is known for, but not in the way that it seems like neighborhood businesses and residents have been talking about, especially most of this year. Yeah, it's interesting. I've kind of been like reading some of this coverage, and it also seems like there's a mix where there are like business owners and residents who are saying it really has felt different and really is a significant problem. Some people are also saying, you know, some of this is overblown and they feel like Southside is getting an undeservedly bad reputation. Um, I-, I will admit, like, I have not spent a lot of time on the Southside late at night recently. Um, I'll, g- I'll go out there to eat, but um, I kind of associate it with, like, the first summer I came home from college and was 21. It was really exciting to finally hit all of these bars legally for the first time. Yeah, 22, 23, 24, Southside was, like, so much fun. But now now it's my daytime place. <laughs> And Sophia, I know you said you had to Google where Carson City Saloon is. Um, Have you spent much time on the south side? Guessing you've never had a fishbowl there. No, I haven't. Um, Don't know what a fishbowl is. Uh, Like you, Mallory, I am mostly there during the daytime. I know I'm in my early 20s, but I'm not a big drinker. So I don't really know if there's uh, other big attractions there at night. (laughs) Your liver probably thanks you. But yeah, so the city seems to acknowledge the experience of a lot of these neighborhood groups. They say, we hear you, we understand. But they also seem to stand by this idea that the neighborhood is mostly safe aside from these isolated incidents. The police, for example, promised to increase their presence late at night. Carson City Saloon closed, I believe, on July 10th, which came right on the heels of a few separate shootings, one of which was fatal. Mm. And I think that was kind of the tipping point for the owner, Brian. Did we ever get any more details about those patrols? I remember when that was announced, but like what has happened since then? Yeah, at least initially they had 20 officers on dedicated patrols. Um, I believe it was Thursday through Sunday from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. And I didn't realize this, but the police said at the time that they had no dedicated patrols during that period. So Hmm. I think the word that um, Police Chief Larry Scarato used was chaos. Like, that's why it was like that. So this was, again, right on the heels of him joining the police force. And he was like, "Okay, it's time. 
Yeah, and I know WESA reported some stats from just before these patrols started. There were actually more shootings and calls for shots fired from May to July last year in this part of the South Side, although none of those shootings were fatal. And we'll have a link in the show notes if you want to read the details. Yeah, and police said that in July, I think it was just a week or so after that story from Kylie Kosinski at WESA, um, that people aren't wrong to feel like unsafe because the violent crime stats are worse overall in 2023. Just it's not reflected in that short period that they were looking at specifically. Very small aside, I really wish that we had real time numbers to compare it to. Like other cities do share real time crime data. And I really wish that Pittsburgh would. Um, It would make reporting on things like this a lot more transparent and people would know exactly how their neighborhood is doing. But that's a separate soapbox. This is the CityCast call for making this information public. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but yeah, I know from from some of the reporting this summer that some of the residents um, in this neighborhood wanted curfews, which, you know, have a pretty controversial history. But yeah. I think it was a WESA story where some residents said that a lot of the, the problem is coming from teenagers just hanging out around their vehicles. Yeah, I asked um, Police Chief Larry Scarato about that last month. Um, We had talked to him about something totally separate, his personal coming out story. So we'll link that episode in the show notes. Um, But yeah, while I was at HQ on the north side, um, I wanted to know what they're doing in the south side and talk about some of these neighborhood worries. Um, I'd asked him whether he thought a curfew could work for Pittsburgh. We've had them. They don't and haven't in the past impacted violence in any meaningful way. Uh, I, I, there's just more of a shared responsibility on parents to, to have oversight of your child, especially those that are under the age of 18, more importantly, when they're in their early teens. So I haven't seen a city where curfews are very impactful and the care in which it takes to remove a juvenile from a situation or from, uh, from the streets is really personnel intensive. Uh, so There are so many facets to juvenile detention and, more importantly, curfew enforcement uh, that I just haven't seen the impact in, in such a significant way that it would be something the city should pursue. Yeah, I'm glad we're not doing any curfews. I don't really think they work. And, you know, um I'm sure teenagers are hanging out here because they don't have any place to go. There's not a lot of accessible free spaces in the city for young people to hang out, Mm -hmm. I think, late at night. And I think putting a curfew doesn't get to the root of that problem at all. Yeah, I remember our friends across the state, CityCast Philly, uh, they did an episode about curfews after their city council voted to enact one. And they spoke with an expert who said, you know, research shows that curfews really aren't effective at reducing violent crime. And she also pointed out that young black people experience disproportionate contact with the police, which can have all sorts of harmful outcomes and curfews can contribute to that. So, yeah, it doesn't really seem like the right solution to implement here. Yeah, yeah. I was also interested in other strategies people are taking or could take beyond or in addition to increased police presence on the South Side. And I know we've already shouted her out in this episode, but Kylie Kaczynski did some really great reporting this summer for WESA, especially on how business owners might come into play here. So uh, one thing she covered is called the Southside Hospitality Partnership. It's a group of 10 bars that have been working together to try to rein in some of the rowdiness, I guess. Um, They've set up things like a shared ID system so that if someone's banned from one of the bars in the group, they're banned from other ones, too. And they also started putting security footage on this shared app so that everybody can kind of see what's going on in real time, um, you know, throughout the bar scene. I can imagine that's probably really helpful, even for, you know, smaller scale stuff like a petty theft or something like that. Like if someone runs out of the frame of a camera, it's really helpful to be able to check another camera in real time. Yeah. And uh, Kylie also wrote about something called the Disruptive Properties Program uh, that's kind of supposed to penalize these so-called problem properties, like a number of people, um, including Southside City Councilor, have said there's really just like a small number of problem bars that are the ones contributing to the issues on the South Side. I think they call them nuisance bars now. Nuisance bars. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess this is a program where if owners of a property get three citations within a year, then they'll start getting fined every time there's another public safety call to their property. And so this would be citations like noise issues, selling alcohol to minors, 
liquor consumption on streets or sidewalks. It, it had been in effect in Pittsburgh, then became kind of defunct, and Mayor Ganey revived it last summer. Um, and it's sort of meant to be a tool to hold like property owners, landlords um, responsible for repeat offenses. Um, but as of last month, when Kylie published this article, so far, no properties had come under review. So it's not clear, really, if this is like a tool the city is actually going to utilize or if it will even be helpful at all. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard about that. I can see like if you're a business owner that caters again to like a rowdier crowd that plays loud music, that might have you come under fire a lot more often. That could be harmful, I think, to a business if it's used in that way. Yeah. Um, One thing that struck me is that like in the Trib, for example, in the wake of all this, they were pointing to arrests being down as an indication that the city wasn't doing enough. But to me, that's always like a strange conclusion to draw because it really lacks a lot of nuance. Um, Lower arrests don't automatically mean that people aren't doing things like it could mean that some of these alternative approaches are actually working and keeping people out of incarceration. Um, I Scarato has called arrests like a tool, but not the objective, which I mean, I hope that what he's saying is actually how he feels, because I don't want any more people in Allegheny County Jail than we absolutely have to have. Yeah, more people in the jail is definitely not a good thing. I was wondering, can the city shut down a few of the busy streets in the neighborhood for pedestrians only and kind of make it uh, like an entertainment district like Bourbon Street in New Orleans or Beale Street in Memphis? The city would love to. They had a whole task force to study their options a few years ago. Mallory, I don't know if you saw any of that while you were reporting elsewhere. Uh, But no, on the police side, at least, there's a lot of squishy stuff with our search and seizure laws here. Um, And also Carson Street is just legally weird itself because like the city owns a portion of it, but then PennDOT, the state, owns another section. So it's not a viable option unless a bunch of things change. So, I mean, at this point, summer is basically over and Carson City is back open. Are they thinking it's better now? I think they're thinking they're hopeful and the Steelers are about to kick off their season. So they really need the extra dollars. Um, I mean, historically, crime is worse in the city, in any city in July and August. And now, like you said, we're headed into fall. The universities are back. Football is back. So I guess we will see. The Pittsburgh Citywide Task Force on Employee Ownership was created to help businesses in the Pittsburgh region thrive and grow by bringing the message of employee ownership and its benefits to 30,000 businesses in the area. The task force was formed in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Center for Employee Ownership, the Pittsburgh City Council, Heinz Endowments, Chatham University, and the University of Pittsburgh. Employee ownership is a business model and form of succession planning that benefits owners, workers, companies, and communities alike. Interested in learning more? The task force will be holding in-person informational sessions around the Pittsburgh region. To learn more about the task force or to sign up for an informational session, please visit pghbusiness.org. That's pghbusiness.org. So speaking of the Steelers, they're back on Sunday at home, which means the North Shore is going to be a big old mess. It's the regular season and we're playing the best defense in professional football, the 49ers. I know you both are so excited. Yeah, I mean, I am I will lose all Pittsburgh credibility, but I am not a huge football fan, as we've established on this show before. <laughs> Neither am I. Uh, I've been to just a couple college football games, um, but I am super confused about why we have preseason. Like, what's the big difference between preseason and what's kicking off now there are lots of answers for this but i think the easiest one is like roster decisions um so like they can decide on team dynamics and who's going to fill what position and they have like up to a certain period to decide like who's going to be on the field in given waves so like they'll have more people on the team at the beginning of the preseason and then they'll cut a few of them if it turns out that they're like not the best mix for whatever it is we're trying to do that year Thinking of um, any listeners out there who might be more like Sophia and me, um, are there ways to engage with the Steelers or, you know, our other professional teams for people who don't actually care about football? Like, what's the best way for us to not just like survive this season, but actually take advantage of it? (laughs) 
<laughs> well, my biggest pro tip is that if you're uh, a Pittsburgher who does not care about professional sports, go grocery shopping during the games, <laughs> especially home games, because it's empty in there. You can get everything you want. The aisles are nice and clean. It's it's a good time. That um, is such a good hack. <laughs> I've done it many times. Um, also, I think like it's interesting to follow how some of these conversations around stadiums and the economics of teams work. Um, like the city will tell you that, oh, it's such a huge economic boon and we want to have a team here. But I found this really funny story from Marketplace from a couple years ago that actually says that's not really true. There are a lot of things economists disagree on. The economic impact of sports teams isn't one of them. If you ever had a consensus in economics, <laughs> this would be it, that uh, there is no impact. Michael Leeds is a sports economist at Temple University, and he studied Chicago, as big a sports town as there is, with five major teams. And he found... If every sports team in Chicago were to suddenly disappear or relocate tomorrow, the impact on the Chicago economy would be a fraction of 1%. A two-run homer to give the Cubs the early lead. We talk about sports a lot. We pay a lot of attention to them. But when it comes to their actual economic contribution, it's minuscule. A baseball team has about the same impact on a community as a mid-sized department store. So if anyone ever tells you, like, the Steelers, the Pens, the Pirates, they have to be here because they make so much money for the city, now you can point to them and be like, nah, I think actually Macy's does more. Megan, I'm surprised you're advising us to to not put up a strong fight for why these sports teams need to stay in Pittsburgh. I mean, there's a lot of civic pride, right? Like, I grew up a Steelers fan, even though I lived nowhere near Pennsylvania. Um, But I don't think it actually matters. we got to keep this stuff in perspective. Um, While I have you talking about sports, though, I decided that I would give you my other top five fun and mostly useless things to know about Pittsburgh sports right now. Are you ready? Yes. (laughs) Sophia is sort of smiling at me in a nice placating way. (laughs) I'm sure this will be useful if someone asks me about sports. I only want to tell you what is like conversationally necessary. And so you can like follow along and nod if an old timer in your life is like telling you about a thing. And you're like, yeah, I kind of heard that once. Sure. Uh, So number one, um, Steelers wide receiver George Pickens plays a lot of video games. One of them is Madden, like the NFL simulation game. So he has played using his own player and he thinks that his player rating is too low, that he should be more highly valued in the video game. That's funny. That now makes me wonder what like other players throughout the NFL think of their ratings and if there would be some mass movement to try to readjust them. I also love that he used like regular press time in the locker room to talk about this. It's clearly an issue that's near and dear to him. They were trying to talk to him about like how he feels about the season and he was much more fired up about his rating in Madden. Um, Number two, uh, Steelers quarterback Kenny Pickett, by the way, Pickett and Pickens is messing up every sportscaster in the NFL right now. And it's hilarious every time. Um, He got married over the summer and now he and his wife are regularly appearing in local home furnishings commercials. And they're always funny to me. That's super cute. Yeah, it's precious. He's 25. I didn't actually catch her age. They were both college athletes um, from the same hometown in New Jersey. And I just think it's precious that they're now talking about picking out lamps between Steelers quarters. I feel like this is how you'd get me invested in sports. Like, tell me all the cute stories about all the players and what they're doing now and what they're doing outside of sports, video games, home furnishing commercials. (laughs) Yeah, I'm impressed with this curated list so far. (laughs) See, I knew my audience. Number three, uh, The Athletic, the outlet um, that got bought by the New York Times, they just do sports. They have been for five years now asking agents anonymously a bunch of questions about tea and the sports that they care about um so they just want to know like what's the hot goss how do you really feel about things because they won't say it on the record but they might say it if it's not on the record so i think this is sort of fun anyway the general manager of the steelers who helps set some of that roster stuff apparently he has a very good reputation they voted him among the most trustworthy of any gm in professional football and yeah this makes me proud of our hometown Number four, we're going to move on to the next team. Uh, Pirates favorite Andrew McCutcheon is out for the rest of the season, which wraps up mercifully on October 1st. Uh, Pirates have not been doing so well this year. 
Yeah, there was there was so much hope for this team when the season started. And they were doing that so good at the beginning. Away. I yeah. know. Um, Kutch has a partial Achilles tear. Um, it's not clear whether he's going to be back in Pittsburgh at all. So his contract here was only good for one year. And he said this week that he really wants to keep playing as a pirate. Quote, it's not going to feel right anywhere else. Mm. I love his devotion to Pittsburgh. I know. And that's like sort of a sad note because the Buccos are definitely going to finish out this season with like one of the worst records in their league. Okay, can you close us out on uh, maybe happier fun fact that what that fact wasn't really fun. It wasn't McCutcheon getting injured in the Pirates and may or may not as always bring him back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Last up, number five, AT&T Sportsnet, the network that most people watch the Penguins and the Pirates on, um, got bought. So there was a question about how those TV contracts were going to work. So Fenway Sports Group, who also owns the Penguins now, They bought AT&T Sportsnet, so people will be able to watch their hockey this fall. Um, Pens are back in late October. Um, It's not clear whether they're going to keep the Pirates games or not. That's not for sure, for sure. Um, But there's a lot of hope. So Pens games are good news. The Pittsburgh Citywide Task Force on Employee Ownership was created to help businesses in the Pittsburgh region thrive and grow by bringing the message of employee ownership and its benefits to 30,000 businesses in the area. The task force was formed in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Center for Employee Ownership, the Pittsburgh City Council, Heinz Endowments, Chatham University, and the University of Pittsburgh. Employee ownership is a business model and form of succession planning that benefits owners, workers, companies, and communities alike. Interested in learning more? The task force will be holding in-person informational sessions around the Pittsburgh region. To learn more about the task force or to sign up for an informational session, please visit pghbusiness.org. That's pghbusiness.org. And if you aren't planning on watching any games this weekend, there is still a ton of events out there. And a lot of them are actually free because Rad Days is starting off this weekend. But before we get into exactly what Rad Days are, are either of you familiar with Rad in general? I know it's the Regional Asset District, and I have to look up what that is every single time I talk about it. Yeah, no, it's like an acronym I hear all the time in Pittsburgh, but never really remember what it means. (laughs) Remind me. Yeah, fair enough. So RAD is a form of public funding in Allegheny County, and it gets its money from 1% of sales and use tax. So half of that money goes to the county and the municipalities. uh, That's for tax relief and government services. But the other half goes to things like libraries, parks, cultural organizations. They give out grants, and part of that money is going to this cool month uh, free outdoor arts and culture activities, museums. Uh, There's just a bunch of really cool stuff. So that includes more than 70 events and experiences that start today and run until October 17th. We'll link the full event schedule in our show notes so you can find whatever tickles your fancy. Uh, (laughs) The one thing is that you should pre-register for some events and tours. I tried to get tickets for the Mattress Factory, but they are already completely booked up. Oh, wow. That's way faster than I thought it would be. All right. I'm going to get on this immediately then. Yeah. And I've also got ahead and looked at some events and I have a couple recommendations for both of you. I Yeah. Our personal challenge to Sophia was to please recommend an event that was right for our personalities with no context <laughs> or guidance. So I can't wait to see what you came up with. Yours first, though. What did you pick for yourself? OK, for myself, I picked the Owl Prowl. Uh, that's at Beechwood Farms Nature Reserve. Pre-registration is required. And there's a couple of options here. Uh, you can go on Thursday, September 28th, Thursday, October 5th and Thursday, October 12th. Okay, Sophia, now is the test of how well you've gotten to know us over the past month. Uh, Let's start with Megan. What do you have recommended for her? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think very timely with our previous section on sports. Megan, two sports events for you. Excellent. Not games. Not games. Okay. Yeah, if you want to go behind the scenes, Akershire Stadium is doing free tours on Wednesday, September 27th. So um, 
areas of the tour are subject to change, but right now you should be able to take a look inside the locker room, go in the field, the Great Hall, all that stuff. You look very excited. I am very excited. Also, I think my dad would be very excited to see this. Thank you. I love this one. Yeah, go together. And if you prefer baseball, uh, PNC Park is also doing free tours, and that's in October on Tuesday the 17th. So one sports event for each month for you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Mallory, looking devious as hell over there. Uh, what did you pick <laughs> for so her? I'm so curious. Yeah, so yesterday you were talking a little bit about Union Project, and this is your excuse to get there for real, mm-hmm. for free. Mark your calendar for Saturday, September 23rd, uh, and this is from noon to three. You can join the Union Project's teaching artists to make some fall leaves out of clay if you want some fun decorations. Um, And if you don't want to get your hands dirty, you can also just watch them do some pottery on the wheels. Ooh, I love this. Yeah, Union Project. I've been wanting to go learn how to make pottery. So this sounds like the perfect entry point. This is perfect, Sophia. Everyone I know has gotten into ceramics lately. I love this hobby for all of you. (laughs) I know I feel a little bit basic, but I'm just going to lean into it. It sounds fun. The other event uh, I want to recommend just to see how you would react. There's a Ballet 101 class. Um. You don't know about my traumatic history with ballet, which is <laughs> my last semester of college. I got an emergency email saying I hadn't fulfilled my athletic requirement and I wouldn't be allowed to graduate unless I did. And the only thing that still had room was beginner ballet. But no one else in there was actually a beginner. I think they all just wanted to feel superior to you. Specifically. <laughs> superior to me specifically. I was the only person who showed up in like an oversized T-shirt and not a unitard. Um, so, Sophia, that was a that was a noble effort. There's no way you would have known about my past with Ballet 101, but I might be skipping this event. But maybe a listener will enjoy it. I, you know what? I actually think I might like that, although I am truly a beginner. <laughs> I mean, no promises that people with a little more skill might show up, but it also does not require a unitard. It does say suggested attire is socks or ballet slippers. So I don't think any equipment is required. Okay. I'll I'll think about pulling out a pair of socks, but <laughs> anyone who has ballet slippers is not welcome. They're not a beginner. <laughs> That's like the screener question. Yeah. And one quick update before we go. Last week on the show, we talked about the city's new bow hunting idea to cull deer from Frick and Riverview Parks. And I complained a lot about the lack of clarity for would-be hunters. Yeah, but we've got a few more details now, like who qualifies. So you have to be a resident of Allegheny County. You need a clear background check. And you have to either have a county tag or have plans to purchase one. And then you've also got to take an accuracy test to see if you're, you know, as strong with a bow as you claim. I want to go to the accuracy test. Like, I just want to watch. I think that'll be a fun time. Yeah, it sounds like you don't need a hunting license, though, right? Uh, So, you know, if I was better in my high school gym classes, two week archery unit, could I show up? Yeah, you should go to the test and ask them. I mean, there would definitely still be time to get a license if it turns out you do need one. I wonder what kind of bows they use and whether they're city provided. Is it like BYO weapon or like manual ones? Can you bring crossbows? I have a lot of questions still. Yeah, Megan, I think with each new development with this story, you're still just going to have a bunch of questions and a lot of skepticism, (laughs) it seems like. I feel like anyone who wanted to show up to an accuracy test would have their own bow. Like, I feel like that's commitment. I agree. And I also wonder if this is going to count towards like your hunting quota for the year, Um, because you can only hunt so many, at least on the books. Um, And if I'm a hunter, maybe I prefer a well-fed country deer instead of one of these scrawny city ones. These are all great questions. And kind of just a reminder for anyone who's listening who didn't catch last week's episode, we do have like a pretty significant problem with uh, deer overpopulation here that's creating all sorts of issues, including the fact that it puts the deer themselves in danger because there's just not enough food and some of them are starving. So that's, you know, part of why there's this call. Um, But, you know, over the holiday weekend, the city tweeted out a call for archers um, and people had thoughts. The tweet kind of went viral. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of my favorites with you. So Chris Potter, reporter for WESA, uh, he tweeted out, townsfolk of Pittsburgh, thy liege lord is seeking archers to complete a quest. Huzzah. (laughs) And then someone named David Paternostro tweeted out, everyone is always so quick to say that studying the Middle Ages isn't relevant until the Lord Mayor of Pittsburgh needs to raise archers to manage the crown stags. Wow, they they all they all went Renaissance. I I gotta say, I didn't see that coming. 
Yeah, the tweets were very uh, Renaissance tinged. I have to say, um, this guy spelled Pittsburgh without the H, which originally I thought maybe meant he was trying to go like very old timey back to the 1890s when there was that minute where Pittsburgh officially dropped the H for a little bit. It's okay. Um, In the hearts and minds of countrymen everywhere, we still don't have the H. The misspelling continues. Exactly. Well, and then I also saw his location. He's outside of Pittsburgh, which I think actually just illustrates the fact that this tweet went like viral, viral, not just viral on Pittsburgh Twitter. But this is like a real thing. City Council approved the program this week. So if you are listening and you do have solid archery skills, Sophia, I'm talking to you. Maybe he not actual call. skills. Not good. <laughs> Definitely blunted arrows. I don't think they were giving <laughs> high schoolers like proper equipment. I think our next CityCast field trip is shadowing Sophia during the skills test. Please. Quite honestly, I don't even know if I was holding the bow right. <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Our music is by Benji. Mallory Falk is our lead producer. Our audio producer is Sophia Lowe. And Francesca DeBecco writes our newsletter. I'm your host, Megan Harris. We will be back on Monday with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend, everyone. Was that too much sports? Did you both survive?